We're going to read from a portion of scripture, and then we're going to navigate our way through it and talk about some truths that um, are very practical uh, for our lives out of the section of scripture that we're going to read today. Paul the Apostle writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 12 through 19. Is there anybody who likes to study their Bible? We're going to do that today. This is what Paul writes to the Corinthians. He says this. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, listen to this, then our proclamation is in vain. And so is your faith. These first century followers of Jesus struggled with the same thing that you and I struggle with in our modern day, and that is the unbelievable reality of the resurrection from the dead. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we've testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Now listen to these words. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ also perished. Verse 19, if we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. Today, as we focus our attention on the resurrection of Jesus, I want to speak to you from this subject today. If you're writing notes, a risen faith, a risen faith as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and its centrality to our faith. Will you pray with me just one more time today? Father, we thank you for your word. It is alive, it is active, it is powerful. It cuts to the core of who we are. Speak to us today. We need your word. No one needs Jason Parrish's words, but we need your word. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people shouted, amen. amen. Come on, can we praise Jesus just one more time? Come on. Come on, grab your seats. Tell the person next to you, you are the best looking thing I've sat next to all week long. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to try to jam some more people in here. Is it all right if we study our Bibles today? Yeah. Come on, I said, is it all right if we study our Bibles today? Yeah. All right. The entirety of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a discourse on the resurrection. Paul the Apostle, author of two letters in the, to the Corinthians, found in the New Testament, if you're new to studying your Bible, is reminding <clears throat> this church of the gospel that he had preached to them to which they had been saved and they had taken their stand upon, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 2. This section of scripture is Paul reminding them of the power and the centrality of the resurrection to their faith and subsequently our faith. How many of you would acknowledge today that the Christian faith is predicated upon a miracle? Maybe if you're new to Christianity, if you're new to faith, uh, you may not fully understand this, but I wanna help us out today and let you know that the entirety of our faith is predicated on Jesus getting out of the grave. This is a very important part of our Christian faith. And this is what Paul says. Paul tells them that our faith is a risen faith. He says that if Christ has not risen, then we should be pitied more than anyone else. I wanna to say to us today that if Christ has not risen, then us being in church today is entirely purposeless. Y'all see what I'm talking about? There's no point in us getting up early on this rainy day in the Salt Lake Valley to come to church if Christ indeed has not risen. Because you can get a better talk at a TED Talk, and Tony Robbins will give you more hype than I will give you. The reason that we have gathered today, come on somebody, is because of a risen Savior. Because of an empty tomb. It's not out of tradition. 
One of the things that our church, and I'm not making a jab at anybody, so please don't, don't hear what I'm about to say as that. One of the things that is part of our makeup, our fingerprint this year is we don't major on a lot of the Easter stuff. We don't do Easter egg hunts. We're not gonna have the bunny around and everything like that because at the end of the day, we can get that everywhere else. There is a central reason why we have gathered today and it is because Jesus, at least so we believe as Christ followers, got out of the grave. Now that's not to say you don't go to Easter egg hunts after this because we're going to have some for our kids and do all of the things. But how many of you acknowledge there's a reason that you're here today? David Pryor, author of the new, uh, of the message of 1 Corinthians, Life in the Local Church, a book, he comments, Paul underlines the truth that faith is produced by looking to Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. Faith is not created. How many of you acknowledge this with me today? Faith is not created, sustained, or increased by looking at ourselves or at others, but only by absorbing the reality and the implications of the resurrection of Jesus. Another commentator would write this. He, Paul, argues that to deny the resurrection of the dead generally is to deny the resurrection of Christ specifically, which has disastrous theological consequences. The whole structure of Christian preaching and belief, it collapses, he would say. As a pastor, as the pastor of this church, I have nothing to say if Jesus, in fact, didn't get out of the grave. If Jesus didn't get out of the grave, everything that I'm teaching you is just self-help. Come on, somebody. But because Jesus got out of the grave with passion and with expectation, I will shout all the more loudly so just one more person will hear about the miraculous reality that Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave when he stepped out of that tomb. And my concern for the 21st century church is that we are somehow, through the process of philosophy and academia, we are removing the sheer weight of the miraculous reality that Jesus got out of the grave. Can I prove it to you? No. With science, with mathematics? No. But with the weight of this scripture? With the weight of this book right here, I believe to the core of my being yeah. Yeah. that Jesus, fully God and fully man, yeah. stepped out yeah. of the tomb like he said he would. Yeah. This commentator goes on to write, Paul endeavors to demonstrate the ruinous implications of such a belief that Jesus didn't get out of the grave. Another way to say it would be like this. Someone needs to write this down today. If the tomb is occupied, then we have an empty faith. An empty tomb means we have a risen faith. Mark Taylor, who we just read, is correct that without the resurrection, and I quote, the whole structure of Christian preaching and belief, it collapses. And Paul will make a powerful statement that is worth our examination today due to a particular word that he's gonna use. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 14, Paul writes this, and if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation, it's in vain, and so is your faith. The Greek word that Paul employs for vain is the word kinos. It means empty, hollow, meaningless, aimless, unaccompanied with the demonstration of spirit and power. Also across scripture in many different areas, we will see that this word means with empty hands, having nothing, fruitless, without usefulness or success, of that which there is nothing of truth or reality, false, fallacious, empty words, meaning false words, literally deceitful. Here's the truth that I want us to to grab a hold of today, church, is that the volume of the gospel is found in the miracle of the resurrection. I'm going to say it one more time. The volume of the gospel, the weight of the gospel, the filling of the gospel is predicated upon the resurrection. Let me illustrate what I mean by this this way. How many of you would acknowledge today by show of hands, this is a full container of water today, right? Some of you are like, this is a trick question. I'm not raising my hand. (laughs) Some of you are like, it's too early to raise my hand. Um, This is a full, at least seemingly full container of water. 
Now, many of you are smart enough to see that there's something else inside of it. And here's what Paul's saying to us as we talk about the resurrection, as we look at the resurrection to our faith, is that if we actually remove the resurrection, we lose the volume and the structure of our faith. And all we have is a bunch of sayings by a crazy person. We have a bunch of miracles that may or may not have been true if we remove the resurrection. But when the resurrection stays intact in our faith, when we understand what we have through Christ, it means that we have a full faith, a faith that is true, a faith with volume, a faith that is not built on a bunch of weird thoughts by somebody, but by a man who was fully God who stepped out of the grave. So the resurrection creates the volume to our faith. When I remove this jar, there's a displacement change. The water returns to normal levels. I want to submit to us today that without the resurrection, we have the story of a guy who said some crazy things. And in the end, he did not do what he said he would do. The words of Jesus himself in John chapter 11, verses 25 to 26, where he says this, listen to what Jesus says. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? These these words fall flat at best, and at worst are simply the words of a lunatic, if there is no resurrection. Now, I was struck by a conversation that I watched take place today by a theologian and a scientist. Ian Hutchinson is a professor of nuclear science and engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or known as MIT. T, a college which uh, wanted me to go, but I didn't. I turned them down. (laughs) Why are you laughing? (laughs) He is an international expert on on physics and plasmas. He was formerly head of MIT's Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering. He is editor-in-chief of the leading journal Plasma, Physics, and Controlled Fusion, which is an interesting read if you ever get time to read through it. (laughs) In 2008, he was chairman of the Division of Plasma Physics of the American Physical Society. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and Institute of Physics. In addition, he has authored over 200 scientific articles and two advanced science textbooks. And this is what he says concerning the resurrection. He says, Christianity, as I have suggested, really depends upon a miracle. The resurrection of Jesus. Listen to what he says. If Jesus is not raised, you know, then we're all still dead in our sins. This is a leading academic thinker and professor at MIT who is a Christian. And on this Sunday morning, he is not looking at beakers. He is not dug into textbooks. He is sitting in church, lifting his hands and celebrating a risen Savior that defies everything that he believes. If you go on to read his work, he would say that science and and the miraculous actually don't have to cancel each other out. We're not, we're not against these things, and these things are not against each other. And he's found that his life work is, has brought him closer to Jesus as he studied the miraculous in Scripture. He believes in the resurrection, not to spite his scientific training or to demean it, but rather because he has faith. He has a risen faith because of an empty tomb. Come on, is there anybody in church today that has a risen faith because of an empty tomb? And so today on this Resurrection Sunday, I want to leave us with three truths that I believe that we can rest in as we leave here today because of the resurrection. I hope these encourage you. I hope they strengthen you today. I hope they cause all of us to reflect upon Christ at a deeper level today as we go about our business, as we go, go about doing our things, our dinners, our get-togethers, and whatever you're gonna find yourself doing today. I pray that you leave here considering things maybe differently than how you came in today. Here's the first one. We need your help today. Shout number one. Here's the first truth that we have is that we have, because of the resurrection, come on, somebody, a future and a hope. We have a future and a hope. First Peter chapter one, verses three to five says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Come on, someone shout living hope. Living hope. 
Through how? How did it happen? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. It's kept in heaven for you and for me. See, we're not told that we not only have a future and a hope, but scripture tells us that this hope doesn't disappoint. It's not a fickle hope. It's not a, a thin hope. It's not a hope that is subject to the constant shifting and shaking of our world, but it's a hope that is built on the one who got out of the grave. Come on, show of hands, participation, sport, and church today. How many of you would say with me today that you have been let down or disappointed at one point in life or another at some point? Every single one of us. Auditorium too, come on, can I see your hands today? Raise your hand if you've been disappointed in life at any one given moment today. I can't see you in the lobby or the hub, but I'm pretty sure your hands are raised. Why? Because the human experience includes disappointment. The human experience includes letdown. How many of you would acknowledge today that our world is a shaky world right now? No matter which corner you turn, no matter which news source you open, if you're like me, you are quickly aware that things are shaking that things are moving, that things are shifting. But here's the hope that we have in the resurrection. Easter is a celebration of something that is a firm foundation that you and I can build our life upon. It will not shake, it will not shift, it will not move. We can put our hope in it and we are told by scripture that it's a hope that does not disappoint. See, the truth is today is that many of us walked in here hopeless. My, pray, my prayer is that today you leave here hopeful. Come on. Not hype, not excitement, not good vibes, <laughs> not euphoria due to a positive emotional moment. Not something that feels good because you got your second cup of coffee on the way out. Let's go. <laughs> but I hope that it's secured by the resurrection that we focus on today. See, the resurrection gave the disciples both a future and a hope. See, when they saw everything is over in one moment due to the resurrection, it was no longer over. That's what I love about this moment. Think about the disciples for just a second. They've been following Jesus for three years, and all of a sudden, everything ended. When Jesus said, it is finished, they thought to themselves, yeah, it's over. We're told in Scripture that they go back to fishing. They go back to doing other things. They, they, They did not have it in their minds that there was more to the story. You ever seen a Marvel movie? Yes. Yeah. Is there anybody in here who waits to, all of them, <laughs> yeah. Is there anybody like me who waits through the credits to the very end when they're gonna show you a new segment of what's about to happen? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember that first happened? I remember when I was sitting in the theater for the first time and I watched everybody stay. I was getting up, I was getting walking out, no one was moving. I was like, what did they know that I don't know? <laughs> So in that moment, I found myself, I was like, well, I better sit back down. So I sat down and we watched the credits. I'm like, why are we watching the credits? It's the credits right now. It's the black screen, white words coming down, all the song, the song that I love, the song that I'm gonna look up on iTunes afterwards. I'm pumped, I'm ready to go. The movie ended, didn't like the way it ended, but it ended. These are credits. Why are you all crazy sitting here watching? You don't care who produced the movie. And then all of a sudden, the credits stop rolling and another frame comes back up to do what? Start another story. Come on. This is what the resurrection yeah. is. The credits rolled. The man was buried, mm. but then he got out of the grave Come on. and a new storyline started. That's good. So much so that scripture is going to tell us Peter's fishing and he decides there's no other way to acknowledge Jesus, but to just jump out of the boat. <laughs> the Bible says that he puts his clothes back on and jumps into the water. Why? Because the credits were over and a new story had begun. Mm. That's the resurrection. Mm. Some of you are sitting through the credits right now. Wow. You think your story is done. Wow. You think this is the end of it. Wow. Can I just tell you that the credits are going to end? It's going to go black for just a second. And then, new life. Resurrection. Come on, somebody, in Jesus' name. Through the resurrection, we're told Scripture that we have a future and a hope. If you came in here today hopeless, can I tell you, you have a reason to hope. 
If you came in here thinking you don't have a future, can I tell you right now that you have a reason to believe for the future ahead of you? You can keep on going. You can keep walking this thing out. Number two, everybody shout number two. Here's the second thing that we're taught by the resurrection is that we have new life now. We have new life now. Romans chapter six, verse four says this, therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father, so we too may walk, come on somebody, in the newness of life. Amen. See, many times it's lost in us that the resurrection provides for us now. We have a new life now. We can walk in new life now. Salvation is not just for eternity. Come on, it's for now. Is there anybody who likes things now? Come on, how many of you would agree with me? We live in a generation of the now. I want my update now. I want my internet now. I want my coffee now. We invented minute rice so we could have it now. Can we just acknowledge today, sidestep, that rice shouldn't take a minute, all right? I'm just saying. <laughs> we live in a generation of now, but I watch so many Christians who live out their faith as if it's for later. Wow. I watch so many people who don't understand that the resurrection is for now. That what Jesus did when he got out of the grave, it, it means that you and I can have life now. Not for just eternity. Eternities, come on, that's a gift in Jesus' name. But your faith, that resurrection power is for now. We do not have to live under the weight of our past. We don't have to live under the weight of our mistakes or our failures or our shortcomings. We can have new life now because the same spirit that rose Christ from the grave lives inside of us as we put our faith and our trust and our hope in Jesus. And one of the greatest travesties I see is when Christians do not live out the resurrection that they have now. Mm. Now, I'm going to be very clear with everybody. I said this in the first service. I'm going to say this all day today. I am not a prosperity gospel person. And here's what I mean by that. I mean that Jesus is not our cosmic vending machine. Right. Come on, somebody. He is not our spiritual Santa Claus. I don't believe that if we do this, then I get this. That if I do this, then God will give me this because I've been doing a lot of this and haven't received the things that I thought. Come on, somebody. And then it doesn't add up all the time. But what I do believe is that God wants to bless his kids. I do believe that. But it doesn't always look the way that we think that it's going to look. And here's what I've discovered is that I can have the power of God working inside of me, but that mean, doesn't necessarily mean my bank account is full. Right, right, right. I can have the power of God working inside of me, but it doesn't necessarily mean my body is healed. I can have the power of God working inside of me, but it doesn't mean that I don't still struggle through situations and circumstance. But here's the thing that I do know is that when I'm struggling and when the bank account isn't full and when the relationships have tension inside of them, I still have the same power that rose Christ from the grave living inside of me. And so I can keep on walking out my journey. Why? Because the resurrection is for now. I got new life. Now, Jesus' empty tomb means fullness in life now. And this is good news for some of us in here. Yeah. New life now means that we have the power to continue in our faith and work out our faith even in the midst of the contours and the contention of our human experience. Next weekend, I want to invite you all back to the beginning of a brand new series that we're gonna be calling Mirror, Mirror, a study in identity. What does it look like to find ourselves in Christ? And what does Christ do to answer this question that many of us have, who am I? And what we're gonna see in this journey, it'll be about a 13 to 16 week journey that we're gonna see this power that we have to shape and form us in and through Christ that we can actually live as people in the new life that he's promised us right 
now. So I want to invite you back to that next week. And so this point is very salient for us right now because the truth is, is we have new life now. God wants to shape us and form us now. Can I just declare over some of us in this room today, in auditorium two, in our lobby, in our hub, online, all the places that y'all find yourselves right now. Can I declare over you that God wants to do something new in you now? He wants to resurrect some things in you right now. He's got a new reality for you now. Number three, the last thing is this. Every shout, number three. Three. The third thing I want you to hear today, and I love this one, and this is such an important truth for us as we we look at the resurrection of Jesus. The third truth is this that we can rest in is that we no longer fear death. We no longer fear death. Um, Sounds weird to talk about death on Resurrection Sunday. How many of you, that's like counterproductive in this moment. I wanna give you uh, an interesting stat that I think is important for everybody to realize. Did you know that one out of one people will die? I got that from the MIT scientist. <laughs> people get funny when, when, when we talk about death, especially in church. Um, I think it's funny. People get funny in church when you talk about death, sex, and money. Those are the three things that like, people get squirrely in church. Uh, we talk about all of those around here as well. So uh, come back next week. Um, I read a book this week as I was prepping for this message. that The author made a really um, strong point that I hadn't thought about it this way. And it's fun when people put language to things and then you're like, oh, it was like an aha moment. And this is what he said in the book, and I'm paraphrasing. He says, the minute you come, the minute you are birthed, that first breath is one of your last. And then he would go into a discourse as to how to measure your life. Because it's interesting that we think about new life, but really we've just entered into the process that Paul would tell us about in Scripture called decay. The, the, the minute you and I are born, I know, morbid thought for Resurrection Sunday morning, but the moment you and I are born, we are dying. There's this weird duality to our life. And if we're honest about it, in our Western society, our technologically advanced moment that we are in, how many of you agree? We're doing everything in our power to figure out how to live forever. Yeah. We're, we're doing everything in our power to prolong life. And scientists would actually tell us right now that that humans are living longer, besides going to the Old Testament, humans are living longer than we've ever lived before. We have much better access to healthcare in our our Western world. But if you go to anywhere else, how many of you recognize we're afforded with great privilege in our Western societies? And everything we do, we invent new things to keep us living longer. But the truth is it's the one thing that none of us will beat. We don't have the power over that enemy. Listen to what Paul writes. So Paul's talking about the resurrection of these guys and he's working, they saying, this is the gospel in which we stand and these are the things that we believe. And so don't, don't, don't negate the resurrection because it's so important to our, to our faith that it, it, keeps, it keeps it full, it keeps it, it keeps it real, it keeps it structured. And then he's gonna go on to say, starting in verse 20, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. <clears throat> For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterward at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power, and then listen to these words, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. That last enemy to be abolished is death. And the reason that he has the power is because he got out of the grave. Come on. And Paul's going to go on to write, oh, death, where is your sting? You and I don't need to fear death. 
which makes, oh, someone needs to hear this today by the Spirit of God, which makes life all the more better. But when you fear death, when you fear the end, we run the rat race of trying to prolong this moment of decay. But when I know what is in front of me, when I know I have eternity because of a risen Savior, oh, I can live out this life with some strength. I can live out this life with some faith. I can live out this life with some expectation. Why? Because Jesus got out of the grave because I have a risen faith in Jesus' name. Several years before his own death, C.S. Lewis wrote in a letter to a Christian friend who was dying these words of comfort. He writes, can you not see death as the friend and deliverer? It means, sorry, it means stripping off that body which is tormenting you. Like taking off a hair shirt or getting out of a dungeon. What is there to be afraid of? Has this world been so kind to you that you should leave it with regret? Wow. Wow. There are better things ahead than we leave behind. Wow. Yeah. Don't you think our Lord says to you, peace, child, peace, yeah. relax, let go. Underneath all that are the everlasting arms. these everlasting arms, the arms of a savior who broke free from the grave. And he says, rest in me now. Rest in me tomorrow. Rest in me for eternity. Because there is not another one who has defeated what he has defeated. His name is Jesus. And he is the great grave conquer. Yeah. Come on, church. We have a risen faith in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes in this moment. There's many of us in this room today who have said yes to Jesus. We're at church this morning because we believe this message. It was a great reminder for many of us today, but for some of us in this room, it's a very different story. For some of us in this room today, maybe a friend convinced you to come, invited you a couple weeks ago. Maybe you were just surfing the, the internet. You Googled church in Sandy, Utah, and you found yourself in a crazy place with loud music and a dude shouting at you. I don't know what brought you in here today, but here's what I do know about life. It's, a, it's not by happenstance. Divine moments, divine appointments, you are here on purpose. God saw this day, you sitting in that chair. God knew you would be in this auditorium or the other auditorium or in the hub or in the lobby today on this Easter Sunday. And he wants to meet with you. And as I can be so bold to say, he wants to save you. Oh, yes, friend, we need saving, whether we realize it or not. And so what we're about to do in this moment is to pray a prayer. And There's nothing fancy in these words. There's nothing special in these words. But rather, the power in these words come because of the person acknowledging through these words who Jesus is. Today, we are going to pray a prayer that for some of you in this moment, you are going to declare Jesus as Savior Lord and King of your life. I'm gonna invite all of us all across this building today to pray the same prayer out loud, as loud as we can. We don't wanna leave anybody out today, but if you would say, man, Jason, that's me. I need to say yes to Jesus. I, I wanna say yes to this Jesus you've been talking about all day. Make this your prayer today. Come on, as loud as you can, would you repeat these words after me? Everybody say, Jesus. I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you my past. I'm giving you my right now. I'm putting my future in your hands. Save me, change me, and make me new. And I declare in this moment that I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. Today, I repent of my sins. I turn from my ways. 
to follow your ways. Jesus, today, thank you for saving me. In Jesus' mighty name.